Hi everyone, I'm Judy Powell, Digium Channel Marketing Manager, here with Steve Harvey, Judy, VP of Worldwide Sales and Service, and today we'll be talking with Steve about his role here at Digium, and he was just named a CRN uh, Channel Chief. So uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, name is Steve Harvey, title is uh, Vice President of Worldwide Sales and Service for Digium. I've been here uh, roughly 11 years, and from a background perspective, I, I think I have a fairly diverse background in the industry. I think a lot of times people come into the industry and they might start working in the, in the end user community, and they kind of spend their whole life in the end user community. Uh, I've worked in all three facets of the business. So I started out right out of college. I worked for a large uh, global enterprise organization mm -hmm. that was Procter & Gamble based in Cincinnati. I worked in their telecommunications department where we were designing and building and deploying global telecommunications networks. So I've seen the industry from what an end user sees. Uh, from there, I went to work for one of Procter & Gamble's vendors who was a large uh, regional integrator, spent about 10 years there. So I've seen the industry from the perspective of what a reseller or an integrator does right. day in, day out. And then from there, I went to work for one of that integrator's manufacturers, who was a large uh, network integrator based here in Huntsville, Alabama. Spent about 10 years there, and then that led here to Digium, where I've been uh, at Digium for about 10 years now. So, wow, so you yeah. have seen every aspect. All aspects of the, of the channel, for sure. Okay. Yeah. And how did, um, I know you mentioned you're also, you have service under your title. Mm-hmm. How, uh, how important was it for you to take on that role? Well, service has changed a lot. I think uh, if you go back 10 years ago, 15 years ago in this business, service was an afterthought. You know, even, we even called it post-sales service, right? right? So the thought was you go out, you sell something to the customer, the customer buys it, they deploy it, and then, oh, gosh, after it's sold and we're kind of done generating revenue, right? We now have to support that customer and make sure that we keep them happy at some acceptable level. That's completely changed now with um, recurring revenue models and cloud-based models. Um, you know, people don't pay for things up front anymore. They sign three-year contracts. It's a service thing that goes across the course of three or four years and if you're three years into a, or I'm sorry, if you're three months into a three-year contract and the customer is having trouble and they call your service organization and don't have a delightful experience and get it fixed quickly, well, guess what happens? In month four, that customer may well churn and say, hey, you're not, you know, you're not making me happy, so I'm going to change to someone else. So, you know, the way we think about service now is it is absolutely an integral aspect of the sales process and, and uh, we just think of it that way. So that's why I took on the responsibility. A few things about our service organization. Uh, we take it very seriously. We have um, about 21 people in the organization overall. Uh, 10 are based here in Huntsville. 11 of them are based in San Diego. We run a 24 by 7 by 365 shop. So wow all the time. Uh, we have multiple languages that are spoken inside our tech support uh, department. A few key statistics about the group. Um, we run about a 95% customer sat rate, which is very good for a complex business yes. like Unified Communications. Uh, we have about a 60% first call resolution. One of the things about uh, the tech support group is we have very short hold time. So we only, uh, average wait time is about three minutes in our queues. So, you know, you're not going to come in uh -huh. and spend 35 minutes on hold like you do in some organizations. And then one other thing that's uh, specifically germane to the resellers is we have a very special queue that okay. is worked inside our tech support group that is um, accessible only for resellers who have completed certification. Very short hold times, you'll have you know, almost an instant answer in the queue and you're kind of getting into a, a second tier resource, right? Okay. Assuming that you as a reseller already are likely to have uh, taken care of the tier one problem. So, so yeah, that's a big benefit to the resellers as yeah, well. Yeah, and I would think the resellers would really appreciate and take advantage of that because you know they're getting that maybe top tier support technician, yep. they, not having to go through some of the basic 
They, they absolutely do. You know, there's nothing worse if you're a highly skilled technical person than starting at step one where they say, you know, have you power cycled the unit mm -hmm. or did you configure the most basic of things? So the ability to assume that you've done all that through your certification training and kind of hop into a tier two level is it's very nice. And what's your favorite thing about being uh, the VP of uh, Digium Sales? Well, I, I think it's all about pace of change. I get bored quickly, and yeah. so if I have to do the same thing over and over and over, it gets mundane. And even in my 11 years here at Digium, we've really kind of molted um, four times. Mm -hmm. uh, when I took the job 11 years ago, we really were known for being the uh, uh, owner and steward of the Astros project, mm -hmm. right? And the company really ran a business that sold products around the edges of the Astros infrastructure. Um, gateways, cards, G729 licenses, things like that. Um, we started looking at, well, geez, what are people doing with Asterisk? And we mm -hmm. learned that uh, the primary thing that they were doing was building small and, be, uh, small and medium sized business communication systems. So we bought a company out in San Diego called Four Loops Technologies. That acquisition has really uh, become our SwitchVox product offering. When we started with that, SwitchVox really was kind of a basic IPPBX mm -hmm. product. And so then the third molting was when we began to, to really evolve that product more from a pure IPPBX product into a, uh, a true unified communications engine where we had messaging technology, collaboration tools, uh, status indications, things mm -hmm. like that. And then I guess the fourth uh, molting period for us has been this recent evolution into a service provider. So with things moving more and more towards uh, hosted unified communications, uh, you know, Digium at this point is a full-blown 24 by seven service provider and that comes with a whole new set of expectations yeah. and, and needs. And so back to your original question, what do I love about it? I love the pace of change. Uh, it's just fantastic to see a business evolving like ours has over the past uh, 10 or 11 years. Yeah, it's yeah. been been great working with you all these years, and mm -hmm. I've been a part of seeing those changes take place, and yep. it's exciting. Agreed. So how, um, how did your time spent working um, for an integrator affect your, your effect on the Digium channel? Y yeah, so when you've sat in the seat of the reseller or the integrator, you start to understand what you like and dislike about how manufacturers and customers interact mm -hmm. with you, right? Um, there's really two points. Um, first of all is just the profitability thought. Uh, one manufacturer in particular, whose name I won't mention here, they really just viewed the reseller as a interchangeable drill bit, right? I mean, they, mm -hmm. they don't care if, if it's you today, someone else tomorrow. You're just a stepping stone or a path to the end user. And, you know, did they care about your profitability as a reseller? Not really. You were just a, a tool to get to the end user. So that's uh, one huge part of uh, uh, something that I think really influenced our, our program is we've, we've really looked at it from a profitability point of view, making sure that we've built a program that allows partners to make solid profitability when they sell the Digium line. Second aspect, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, lead management. So one of the things that drove me crazy when I worked for the reseller was a manufacturer comes in, they dump a hundred leads over the fence to you and they mm -hmm. say call them and you got four days to get back with them on lead status. You start calling these people, the phone numbers are wrong, the addresses are wrong, the email addresses are wrong and you're just literally wasting your time much of the time. So at, Dig <clears throat> excuse me, at Digium, uh, we really tried to work around that problem. We run a fairly rigorous sales process here. We do a great job of qualifying our leads. Mm -hmm. And we do not hand our partners leads. Uh, we hand our partners opportunities. So at the time that we hand something over to the partner, uh, that lead has been contacted by Digium. It's been fully BANT qualified to make sure, you know, budget authority needs timing, okay. that there's uh, some sort of real opportunity behind it. By the time we pass that to the partner, it is a legitimate sales opportunity, just not some random lead that you're going to waste your time on. So those are the two aspects of the plan that I think uh, my time working for the reseller really influenced the program. And I know from my time spent in the uh, inside sales group, partners were really appreciative 
of the opportunities that we sent them. Very much so. They didn't feel like they were chasing yep. down a someone who downloaded a white paper or, or some random lead. Yep, yep. We work very hard at that. Yeah. Yep. It shows off. So I had the opportunity last year to interview about 15 or 20 of our partners. And one of the common themes amongst all of them when I asked them why they like doing business with us mm -hmm. was that we're easy to work with. Mm -hmm. Why, yeah. why do you, or why is that important yeah. for us? Well, again, I've worked with manufacturers where, you know, quoting the products are impossible, the, the SKUs are impossible to understand, it takes technical people to quote it. So first and foremost, I think we listen to our partners, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we have this thing we call our advisory council group. Uh, it's a group of 12 or 13 of our partners, not always the biggest. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a mix of big, small MSPs, resellers. We try to get a good mix. And once a year, we get together with them, and they tell us, you know, what are you doing right? What are you doing wrong? What could you do better? What's not working? Where do we have profitability squeezes? We take that information back, and then we try to incorporate it into our programs and our products. And I think, um, I, I think again, the, the profitability aspect of our program is very important. But the ease of doing business really, I think, floats around product and flexibility. So the product, we have an all features included philosophy, mm -hmm. very simple to quote, a few part numbers, you know, it, it's really not a difficult thing to quote at all. Mm -hmm. uh, partners love that. And then lastly, I think is just flexibility. Um, sure, we have program rules just like any other right. vendor, but at the end of the day, when, come, when some partner comes to us with a special, special situation, we typically will look at it and do what's right at the end of the day. So yeah. I think flexibility is a big aspect. So. Yeah, and I think, um, I think it makes them feel comfortable that they know they have a point of contact here at Digium mm -hmm. that they can reach out to yeah. and, and get whatever resolution that they need. Agreed. Yep. So, so how, um, what's having the biggest impact on, uh, on the channel, on Digium's channel for 2018? That one's easy. Uh, that one's just so easy. And I think almost all of our partners could answer this uh, in a snap, and that's the migration to cloud-based services. Mm -hmm. uh, we lived in a world five years ago, 10 years ago, where it was a kind of a one-and-done business, right? You sell it, you install it, you move on to the next customer. And today, everything is moving to cloud. I mean, we're even seeing it in our personal lives, right? Mm -hmm. Things that you could used to could just go buy, now you kind of rent it on a monthly basis. So we're, we're seeing it uh, in our personal lives as well. So helping partners who maybe have grown up in this one and done philosophy as yeah. just a reseller, helping them understand this migration, um, helping them understand how to make profit in that migration, uh, helping them understand how they can add value, add services around the edge of what is really a DGM service offering. Mm -hmm. uh, those are all important aspects of the program and without a doubt the thing that we're spending the most time on helping our partners understand. And how, um, how are we helping them as far as understanding the different profit um, and services and mm -hmm. different avenues of yeah, so of moving into that cloud. Yeah, so uh, again, I think it's about if your view as a partner of um, of UCAS service offerings mm -hmm. is just that, well, gosh, there's really nothing I can do as the partner to add value. All I can really do is identify the opportunity, throw it over the mm -hmm. fence to DGM as a UCAS vendor, and then they're going to take it and run with it as a service provider. Well. You can do that, right? We have, a, we have a, a thing in our program called the agency model for people that want to do that. But for the folks who have really built businesses around adding value, add services, the key is in a UCAS model, how do you engage with the customer and find spots or inflection points in the selling process where you can continue to mm -hmm. add value as a third party? And those are the things that we're really trying to work on. So. Yeah, and I know that we... Uh, <coughs> Uh, one of our partners has pretty much migrated all of his on-premises sales to now a mm -hmm. cloud-focused yeah. and seeing more and more partners move to that no and question. prefer that model. Yeah. yeah, I think three or four years ago, there was a subset of our partners that 
you know, you'd talk to them about, you really need to get on this UCAS bandwagon, and they would kind of look at you like you had horns, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, look, I've been doing it this way for 20 years, and I'm not going to change. And I think uh, those people are few and far between. I remember age. at one of the partner advisory meetings, and we had a partner in there who, you know, just was adamant that he was not going to sell yeah. cloud. And then I think he was cloud partner of the year. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the real difference between MSPs and resellers? Yeah, um, well, MSPs, I mean, managed service provider, right, yep. is what MSP stands for. And it, it's kind of what the words indicate. It's, it's, um, it's a partner who builds a business around helping their end user manage the service, right? Mm -hmm. So they're going to have an ongoing relationship with the customer for moves, ads, and changes, for intrusion detection, for network health checks, for... Uh, queue configurations, you know, all of those kinds of things, um, additions into the network. Um, so there's an ongoing managed services relationship going on between the partner and the end user. Um, the reseller really is more, it's for the sophisticated end user who really kind of knows what they want. They just mm -hmm. need a place to buy it, and they probably want to have someone help them start it up and get it going and turn it over to them, but they plan to manage it themselves on an ongoing basis. So that's kind of the differences between MSP and reseller. Okay. Yep. And I know in our channel program, we have a mix of both, both models of partners. Yep. We have those that um, do have all the services and really, you know, cater whatever that end user may need mm -hmm. and then we have the resellers who um, is you know they help the customer get up and going and then the end user will manage the system so kind of a mix in our program yeah I think I think uh, if I could use a, a grocery store analogy here just for a moment to be silly but um, if you are on a health kick right now right and you're trying to eat healthy and eat natural and all those kinds of things you're probably gonna shop at Whole Foods Right, because they cater to that kind mm -hmm. of clientele. Um, if you got home and you need to pick up some milk and some peanut butter and you know a few staples, you know a trip to Kroger is probably perfect. Yeah. Right. Um, if uh, I'm hosting a dinner party and I'm planning to prepare shabu shabu, right, I probably need to find a Japanese specialty restaurant or not restaurant, but a, a Japanese specialty grocery store to go to. Is Kroger better than the Japanese specialty store? Well, no. You know, they're, they're just different, right. right? So it's like depending on what your need is, you go seek out the service that fits that need. And that's the way we built our program. So we, we, have, uh, um, we have ways for managed service partners to play in our program. We have ways for pure resellers to play in our program. For people who just want to throw things over the fence, we have, uh, you know, an agency program that allows them to just hand it to us and we'll work mm -hmm. it for them. So... Several different ways to go about it. Um, so, yeah, it works well. Okay. Yep. And what sets Digium apart from the other vendors? Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a number of things. I've, I've mentioned profitability a couple of times already yep. in this brief interview, but I'll keep coming back to it. Um, we really care about our partner's profitability. I mean, we really care about it. So we've tried to build programs that have deal registration built in where the partner who goes out does the hard work, finds those new deals, brings them to us, does the hard missionary selling, mm -hmm. right? They get rewarded in a big way for having done that. So uh, profitability is a huge thing. Another thing I would say that differentiates us a lot is our ability to help partners do demonstrations, right? So if you're a reseller or an integrator partner, you probably handle 20 lines. Mm -hmm. You can't be expert in demonstrating 20 product lines. There's just no way, right? And we have a group of people in my sales organization that we call account executives. They work from the inside. And their purpose all day long is to help partners do professional, thorough product demonstrations. And um, so a, a partner trusts us enough to open their doors, let them in to sell to that end user mm -hmm. um, with them. We do these WebEx-based or collaboration tool-based um, demonstrations we know how to demonstrate the product as you can imagine better yep. than anybody because we do it all day long every day and um, it turns out to just be a better demo experience for the end customer and generally they walk away pretty impressed um, just a, a little statistic we are hawks about tracking sales data yes we use salesforce.com a crm tool very aggressively 
And we know that statistically when partners open their doors and allow us to help them sell, mm -hmm. our win rate on those deals nearly doubles compared to when they try to sell it on their own. Wow. So yeah, the days of the partner who puts their hands up and says, you know, you're not going to touch my end user. That's kind of old school thinking, I think, mm -hmm. right? It's like, it's a, it's a three-legged stool. It takes the partner, it takes the end user, and it takes us as the manufacturer to have the most successful selling environment. And that brings up an interesting point because it's not just a new partner that is utilizing that inside group. It is seasoned resellers within oh, yeah. our, our program. Some oh. of our, our biggest partners. Absolutely. Some of our biggest and best, they just recognize that we are better at it than yeah. they are. And it's free. Why not have DGM help us? And they, so they embrace, they embrace the service. So Yeah. yeah. I, I think that's a great benefit. Yeah. Um, and what is your best advice to channel partners? Mm. Yeah, I think it's all about um, understanding what your skill set is, right? You, you got to have you got to have a clear understanding of what you do and don't do well, mm -hmm. right? Once you have that understanding, then I think you have to go out to the marketplace and you have to say, okay, in the market what kinds of customers need the things that I have to offer, right? So now you've, now you know what you're good at. Yeah. You now know who needs those things that you're good at. And then the key is being very selective in staying inside that marketplace that you're good at, as opposed to letting yourself wander outside that marketplace. Biggest mistake any sales organization can make is getting themselves embedded in deals that they had no business ever being in, right? So understand what you're good at, uh, understand what customers need that, and then carefully match that and choose your customers. Wow, Steve, that was some valuable uh, information and advice for our channel partners. Happy to share it. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us for uh, this edition of DGM Live.